All right, so the other day we went over um, Dalton's atomic theory, okay? Dalton's atomic theory is super important for you. In fact, I guarantee that something about Dalton's atomic theory and its four points will appear on tomorrow's quiz. It's tomorrow's Thursday, okay? Um, so remember, the points of the theory are that all elements are composed of tiny, indivisible particles called atoms, okay? Um, second point, atoms of the same element are identical, so all oxygen atoms are effectively the same. Okay? We do know that obviously isotopes exist and they may have different numbers of neutrons, but for all intents and purposes every atom of oxygen is identical. Okay? Uh, atoms of any one element are different from those of any other element. Atoms of carbon are different from atoms of iron or different from atoms of lead. Okay? Uh, third point, atoms of different elements combine in, with one another in whole number ratios to form compounds. Okay, so remember, you never have a half of an atom in a compound. Okay, it's always like one to one, or two to one, or three to two. It's always going to be whole numbers. You can't have a portion of an atom in a molecule or compound. Okay, and the fourth thing is basically outlining what happens in a chemical reaction and outlining that you cannot turn one element into another element. So in a chemical reaction, atoms are separated, joined, or rearranged, but they are not turned into other elements. Okay, that's the important thing to remember. And that one we said yet the other day was the death of alchemy. Okay, that basically forbids you from turning lead into gold. All right, questions on that? Just quick review of the four points. Okay, so once Dalton had outlined his atomic theory, people were generally pretty accepting of it. It seemed to explain the behaviors that they were seeing when they were running their experiments. But the most natural next follow-up question was, okay, great, what does an atom look like? Dalton had no idea. Okay, his answer to that was, well, didn't you read what... My points said they're tiny. I can't see them, and neither can you. We have no idea what they look like. They're like, well, that isn't good enough. Okay? You want us to respect you? Tell us what they look like. So Dalton, being a quick-thinking guy, is like, hmm, Earth is a sphere. By the way, if you're a flat Earth person, that's crazy. Earth is a sphere. It's very round. We know that. Okay? The, the sun is a sphere. The moon is a sphere. Atoms are spheres. Makes good sense. Okay? So he just said, atoms are a solid sphere. And everyone's like, all right, well, that makes sense. Okay. That explains kind of what we're what we're seeing in our experiments. There's nothing really wrong with that. So okay, let's go with that. Okay, and the solid sphere model persisted longer than any other model we've had, simply because nobody came up with any data that could refute it. Okay, we can't see them. Okay, no experiment said that that wasn't what they were, until 1897. A guy named J.J. Thompson is doing experiments with electrochemistry. Okay? Those are the kind of chemical reactions that are used to power batteries and things like that. Okay? So they're chemical reactions that produce electrical currents. They result in the moving of charged particles, in particular, electrons. Okay? The solid sphere model could not explain where these charged particles were coming from. Okay? It could explain that in the reactions that were going on, atoms were being rearranged, but it could not account for where these charged particles came from. The general idea was the reaction produces these charged particles. The problem was is that if it produced charged particles and they traveled through a wire, the mass of the reactants and products should be different. It wasn't. Okay? So they were having trouble kind of coming up with a reason for this. So J.J. Thompson said, you know what? Maybe the model's wrong. Maybe there's these really, really tiny subatomic particles, okay, smaller than an atom or part of an atom, okay, that are charged. They carry a negative charge, and they can fall off in a reaction. And when they fall off, okay, they can travel through the wire, creating the current. I don't really have to change the model too much. I can still say the atom is a solid sphere. The big solid part is positively charged. And then these small negative charges that are running through the wire and making electricity, I'll call electrons, because that makes sense. Electricity, electrons, okay? So he said, I'm gonna change the model, and I'm gonna call it now the plum pudding model. So an atom is a solid sphere, but in lightly or loosely embedded in its surface are small negatively charged particles called electrons that can fall off in a reaction and produce a current. People are like, that's pretty smart. Okay, we'll go with that, okay? After that, for the next 50 years, there is nothing but arguing about what the atom looks like because people are finding new behaviors and new particles all the time. The nuclear age comes in in kind of the late 30s and 40s, okay, and people are doing uh, nuclear physics that is discovering all kinds of stuff about the atom. So the model of the atom is constantly changing. Now we discover protons, we discover neutrons, okay, uh, we discover that, you know, 
atoms can uh, actually be split in half, okay, if, if we have the right equipment. They can be fused together as well, and the results of that are highly energetic, okay? Kaboom, right, when we do either one of those. All right, so people are learning a ton about that. So there's a whole bunch of turmoil, okay, in the, in the field of atomic chemistry because nobody can agree on what the atom looks like. Some people are like, ah, it looks like this, and there's all these different particles stuck in the surface, or maybe there's protons and neutrons, and they're in the middle, and they're the big heavy part, but electrons are really light. But because electrons are negative and protons are positive, they can orbit each other like planets around the sun because you know they're opposites, and opposites attract, just like gravity can attract the Earth to the sun. Maybe it works like that. There's all kinds of different ideas, and there's really no way to prove or disprove any of them. Okay? until a guy named Rutherford came along, okay? Um, when Rutherford came along, he thought, he was one of the people that supported the idea that an atom has a nucleus, okay? And in the nucleus were gonna be your heavy neutron and, or neutral particle and positive particle. And then the electrons would surround that somehow, probably orbiting, okay? He was in, in that kind of camp. He, however, thought that the nucleus would be incredibly small. Right? He wanted to prove that by running an experiment. Okay? And his, his experiment was ingenious. Okay? What he did is he took a source of alpha particles, kind of like an x-ray machine, okay? and he pointed it at a piece of really, really thin gold foil. Okay? So you have aluminum foil at home that you use to cook stuff with, right? Okay? That's probably thousands of atoms thick okay, on its smallest edge. He had a really, really thin piece of gold foil, okay, that would have only been a few atoms thick, okay? And his idea was, if atoms and their nuclei are as small as I think they are, I can shoot these x-rays at the gold foil, and most of the x-rays will go right through, because x-ray particles are really, really small, and they'll be able to fit between the spaces between the atoms. Okay? So his idea was, he'll put the x-ray machine here, he'll surround the gold foil with photographic film. Okay, now, I probably have to explain to you what photographic film is because you were born after digital cameras were invented. Okay? Cameras used to have this stuff in them called film. Okay? And when you would expose the film, the light it would change color. It's called, that's why it's called exposure, if you've ever had to change that setting on your camera. Okay? Um, it exposed the film and the film would, would then change color. So all that would happen here was when an x-ray would hit the film, there would be a spot on the film where it was exposed. Okay? His hypothesis was that basically all the exposure was going to occur behind the film, or behind the foil, sorry, because it was the x-rays were going to get right through it. Okay? What ended up happening was he got exposures everywhere. Okay? Still the bulk of them were behind the foil. Okay? Meaning that he was pretty much right. The nuclei are small, there is a nucleus, but it was bigger than he thought because he got a lot of those x-rays getting deflected by the nuclei of the atoms. So what he drew was a picture like this. Okay? He said, here was the situation. Okay? These are my gold atoms. Okay? So all of these circles are the gold atoms, and the little gray dots in the middle are their nuclei. Okay? The nuclei were way bigger than he thought, so some of the x-rays would hit the nuclei and be deflected. Their direction would change, and they would hit a different part of the film. Okay? So this experiment proved unequivocally the model for the plum pudding model was wrong. Okay? That atoms did have a nucleus, and that the nucleus was actually fairly large okay? compared to the full size of the atom. There was still a lot of empty space in an atom but there was a fairly large nucleus that was very dense in the middle because it could deflect these particles, right? So what you need to get out of this slide is the following. Rutherford, okay, his gold foil experiment, okay, and proved the nuclear model. Okay, that's why Rutherford is so important. He's right up there with Dalton in terms of his importance, okay? Dalton came up with the atomic theory, Rutherford proved the nuclear model of the atom. Right. Now, Rutherford, unfortunately, wasn't entirely right. He did prove the model that has the nucleus in it, but he had no idea what the electrons looked like okay, and how they were arranged. Rutherford's model looked like this, that every electron had its own orbit, and all the orbits were equally offset from each other so that the electrons couldn't run into each other. They were all equidistant from the nucleus. Okay, which we know now isn't true. But of course at the time, there wasn't any way to prove or disprove what electrons did. Okay? 
So you think now that the nuclear model has been proven, everybody would be happy. Okay? Now we know there's a nucleus, now we can get on with things, except that nobody was happy. Because now the argument was about, what are the electrons doing? Where are they? How do they behave? What happens to them when this happens and whatever? So there was still a ton of arguing and models still changing. Okay? So Rutherford's atom didn't last very long. Okay? He worked with Bohr and came up with what we call the planetary or Bohr model, which said that electrons do orbit the, um, the nucleus, but they do so at different distances, just like planets around the sun. That's why it's called the planetary or Bohr model. Okay? And he said that these orbits could contain more than one electron but these orbits were based on energy. The closer to the nucleus the electron was, the less energy it had, okay? Kind of like if you're looking at like potential energy, okay? On the ground, you have no potential energy. On the first floor of a building, you have a little more, second floor, a little bit more, kind of like that, okay? Electrons could have potential energy and also kinetic based on how fast they were moving, right? But he said that they would just orbit in these fixed orbits and basically, if they were in this orbit, that's where they always stayed, okay? Now, Another guy was doing some research, and he discovered that his data was not agreeing with Bohr's model. And people were generally good with Bohr's model, okay? But Bohr's model couldn't explain how photosynthesis worked or how fluorescence works, okay? So this guy named de Broglie was doing these experiments, and he had this material, if he put it in the sun, and then took it out of the sun and put it in the dark, it would glow for a while. It would eventually stop glowing, but it would glow for a while. Okay? And Bohr's model couldn't explain where the energy was coming from for it to glow. Okay? De Broglie's idea was that the electrons in this material could gain energy when they were in the sun, and then when they were placed in the dark, they would fall down to lower energy levels. And when they did that, they released the energy back as light again. So they would glow for a short time. Okay? Photosynthesis works very similar to that. When light strikes the chlorophyll molecule, the electrons in it get excited, and they jump from one level to another and to another, okay? And then during the night, the electrons fall back down, and they release the energy they absorb. That energy is then used to make carbon dioxide and water into sugar, okay? That's what powers photosynthesis, okay? Again, Bohr's model couldn't really explain that, so de Broglie came up with his own, okay? And this is what we generally accept now, the de Broglie electron cloud model. It basically says electrons can be found in this area around the nucleus. Their location will be based on their energy. So there isn't a necessarily a fixed orbit. Okay? There's areas that we call orbitals where an electron can be found based on its energy. Okay? But in general, if you look at an atom, it will look like a cloud of electrons surrounded it because they can move all over the place. Okay? It's much more flexible than Bohr's model, which was very concrete. All right, everybody okay with that? All right, so basically what we know now and what we accept is de Broglie's electron cloud model says there's a dense central nucleus, a fair amount of space which contains electrons whose location is based on their energy, okay? We generally call that the quantum model. Anytime an electron jumps from one level to a next, we call that a quantum leap, okay? Makes a quantum leap from one level to the next. Okay, so generally, we, we know what these orbitals look like now. We have an idea of what their shapes are because statistically we can kind of trace where electrons go, okay? And the lower energy levels kind of have more regular shapes and the higher energy levels, get their shapes get crazier and crazier. This doesn't even show half of them. Okay? There's a whole bunch of different orbitals or places where electrons can occupy when they have certain energy. Okay, the other thing we need to remember is the properties of an element are based on the number of protons in the nucleus, okay? Carbon has its properties because it has um, seven, sorry, six protons, okay? Iron, okay, has its properties because it has 26 protons in its nucleus, okay? The number of protons is what determines the physical and chemical properties of an element, okay? So differing numbers of subatomic particles influence the properties of the different elements, okay? The subatomic particle in particular is protons, okay? So this is why 
an atom can lose electrons and still be that particular atom. The electrons don't influence its properties. The protons do. All right, so on the first page of the chemistry workbook package, there are 12 questions. Okay? They all have to do with the material we've just covered. So what I'd like you to do is open up that file, make sure you've made a copy for yourself, okay? and you can just type the answers in into the workbook. And I'm going to give you about, let's say, a half an hour okay, to work on that, and then we'll go through them together. Okay? So half an hour to answer. Okay? These questions here, I can't obviously show them all at the same time, so you'll need to open that workbook package. Maybe I'll just open it up here. All right, so those are the 12 questions you're going to be working on. Okay, complete sentences. Okay, I mean, the more effort you put into it, the better off you'll be tomorrow when you have a quiz on this material. All right, so for question number one here, the idea of the atom was first proposed by whom? Democritus, right, right? And his idea was rejected at that time because? Um, the Greeks thought, <coughs> thought everything was made of elements. Right, the four elements, yeah. The, the, they had a, a more logical idea that fit better with their understanding, so his idea was rejected. Okay, uh, for question number two, what elements did the Greeks believe all matter was made out of? Well, the four elements were? Fire, water, earth, and air, right? Okay, why was that a logical conclusion at the time? Because they were explained that way, okay? We talked about how lava was some parts earth, some parts fire, and some parts water yesterday, how steam was fire, water, and air, okay? It just made sense, okay? It was logical, so they, they did that. All right, um, during the Middle Ages, the group, a group of people inadvertently did a lot of work to develop the science of chemistry. Who were they? The alchemists. The alchemists, and what were they trying to do? Turn lead into gold. Yeah, they're trying to get rich, turn lead into gold, make the elixir of life, basically do things we now know are chemically and physically impossible. Okay. All right, late 1700s, okay, a man used the data from many experiments on matter to develop an idea on the structure of matter. Okay, who was he? John Dalton. John Dalton, okay, he came up with an atomic theory consisting of four points. Okay, and if you put these in your own words, that's probably even better because you'll remember your own words. Okay, a little better. First point, all matter is made of atoms. Okay, I mean, when it comes right down to it, that's the gist of the first point. Okay, um, second point, okay, atoms of the same element are identical, atoms of different elements are different. Okay, third point, atoms can combine in whole number ratios to form compounds. Okay, fourth point, atoms can be separated, joined, or rearranged in a chemical reaction, but not turned into other elements. Okay, those are your four points. All right, for number five, looking at this theory now, what things do you know of that can prove some of his ideas wrong? He thought atoms were indivisible. Right, he thought atoms were indivisible. I mean, for all intents and purposes, they still are. I mean, we know we can split some atoms, right? Generally, though, we don't split most atoms, right? There are some that are big and unstable, and so they're much easier to break. Okay, uh, so those ones we would split, right? We also know now of radioactivity, okay? And radioactivity is the spontaneous decay of atoms, which means they actually split slowly on their own, okay? Really, all nuclear fission is, is the acceleration of a process that's already going on, okay? Uranium-238 is already radioactive, okay? It's already breaking down slowly on its own. We just make it go faster, okay? Um, now, of course, the discovery of radioactivity was pretty important, okay? Um, unfortunately, it also meant that the scientists who studied it initially didn't have very long lives okay, or careers okay, or anything like that. Um, like, like Mary Curie would have been an example. Okay? She died, I think, in her 30s, okay, something like that. I mean, um, Henri Becquerel, who discovered like x-rays and things like that, he died very young as well. And his desk is still in a museum, and it is still radioactive because okay? he had all these special rocks in there. One of the things he was studying, and of course he'd sit at his desk and he'd go home sick every day, not knowing why. Okay? I mean, he probably glowed in the dark. Okay? We didn't know, right? We didn't, he couldn't see the radiation. People would say, man, I'm sick all the time. I don't know what's wrong with me. Okay? We know better now, obviously. Okay. Um, 
What's another thing? Oh, sorry. Um, we had the indivisible thing. Okay. What, what else? The solid sphere model. Well, okay. Yeah. We know his model isn't isn't uh, yeah. good anymore. But if we're just talking about the points of his theory, he says in this in the second one that all elements of this are sorry all atoms of the same element are identical. Is that necessarily true? No, they all have the same number of protons, but they don't all have the same number of neutrons. Okay? There are isotopes out there okay, that will have different numbers of neutrons, so those atoms will be slightly different. Okay? One of them would be um, carbon-14. How many people have heard of carbon dating? The process that the archaeologists use to radioactively date how old something is. Okay? Um, and what they do is they simply look at the ratio of normal carbon to carbon-14, and the material that carbon-14 breaks down into. Okay? Because carbon-14 is actually a radioactive isotope of normal carbon. Okay? It's not something that would ever hurt you, but it does break down at a very predictable and measurable rate. So all they do is look at the amount of carbon and the amount of carbon-14 byproducts in a material, and they can figure out when it was made okay? and things like that. So um, we do know that they're not necessarily all absolutely identical. They're identical for all intents and purposes. Okay, for number six, describe in your own words the models of the atom discussed here. Brief explanation as to why each was rejected. So the first one was the solid sphere model, okay? But it ended up being rejected because it couldn't explain what? It couldn't explain electricity and electrons, okay? Plum pudding model came along, but it eventually got uh, rejected because we discovered protons. Yeah, and then, you know, there were a bunch of other models kind of in the middle that didn't work. Rutherford's model didn't say what the electrons did properly. Okay? Bohr's model was essentially correct, but didn't really explain how electrons can jump uh, to different levels. So we ended up with the electron cloud model, which not only has the nucleus, but also has uh, an, a, a way to account for the movement of electrons and, and things like that. Okay? All right, for number seven, as our knowledge increased, we discovered the atom had smaller and smaller parts. Name these parts, describe them, and tell where they are located. Okay, so what are the three parts? Protons, neutrons, electrons. Protons, neutrons, electrons. Where do I find electrons? On the outside. On the outside, so or in the cloud, we could even say. Okay, um, where do I find protons? Nucleus. Neutrons? Nucleus. Okay, so guys, um, spoiler alert, every unit exam, I ask a question just like this, and basically I say, draw me an atom of whatever. Okay, and I just pick one at random, okay? So let's just say that I'm picking lithium, okay? An atom of lithium just because it's nice and small and we can drop quickly, right? How many um, protons does lithium have? Three. How do I know that? Right, the atomic number is the number of protons, okay? So I know that a lithium atom has uh, three protons in it. All right, how many neutrons does it have? You have to use its mass to get it, yes. Okay, so here's the trick, in case you didn't know this, and you might not all have known this. Okay, um, to calculate the number of neutrons, okay, we take the atomic mass and we subtract the atomic number. And then there'll be some rounding that'll be involved. Okay, because when I take this for lithium, I'm taking 6.94 and I'm subtracting 3. Well, 6.94 minus 3 is 3.94. Well, I can't have 3.94 electrons. How many electrons do I have? Four. Yeah. Okay. So there are, sorry, there are the electrons, pro, neutrons, sorry. Okay. So I'm just going to put four neutrons here. Okay. So now I've got the nucleus drawn. Okay. And then how many electrons are there going to be? How many? Three. Always electrons and protons have to be the same. Otherwise, the atom would not be electrically neutral. neutral. Right. Okay? So I would just draw a cloud and go one, two, three. Done. Okay? There's my model. Okay? I've accounted for the fact that this is the electron cloud. I might even go cloud just to be perfectly clear. Okay? Maybe I'd put a legend beside it just so there wasn't any you know, confusion. The dashes are negatives, that's electrons, the positives are protons, the blanks are neutral. Okay? Uh, something like that. But I ask that every single time I do the unit exam in this course. I have no intention of changing that. 
Number eight, if I have one cubic centimeter of lead, in fact, let's not even say one cubic centimeter of lead. Let's say I have 10 atoms of lead. Not that I'd ever be able to even measure 10 atoms. That'd be so small, okay? And I have 10 atoms of carbon, okay? The 10 atoms of lead are gonna be way heavier. Why? Uh, their atomic number is way bigger. Yeah, the atomic number is way bigger, which simply means lead atoms have more stuff in them, okay? They have more neutrons, they have more, more protons, so they are heavier, okay? It's again, back to the number of protons influences your properties. Well, the more protons you have, the heavier you're going to be. All right, uh, number nine, nuclear reactors use atoms with very large nuclei, like uranium-237, which has 237 particles, okay? And it's nucleus for fission, which is splitting of the atom, okay? Why wouldn't they use smaller, less dangerous atoms like lithium, which only has seven particles? Larger um, atoms are easier to split. Larger atoms are easier to split. Larger atoms also have? Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say that. They have more energy because they have more mass, okay? It's easier to get a chain reaction going when you're breaking a big atom into small pieces than when you're breaking a small atom into small pieces, okay? Uh, so, yeah, nuclear reactors are gonna do that, okay, um, for sure. Now, how do they do that, okay? Well, nuclear reactors work like this. They basically have a particle gun, okay, that shoots like free neutrons and things like that at fuel rods, okay? So fuel rods are exactly like they sound. They're a big metal rod covered in fuel pellets, okay? The fuel pellets are made of enriched uranium, okay? When they're lowered into the path of the particle gun, okay, the particle gun shoots the particles out, they hit the atoms of uranium, the uranium starts to split, okay? Causes a chain reaction. Well, in a reactor, we don't want that. We don't want the chain reaction to happen, okay? We just want some of the atoms to break, okay? And we can control that by controlling how much of the rod is exposed to the particle gun, right? So if, we're, let's say, in a place in the summertime where it's hot, like let's say you're in Arizona, okay, and everybody's running their air conditioner because it's, you know, it's 50 degrees outside, okay, um, if they have a nuclear power plant, they're going to expose more of the rod to get more energy released, okay. A nuclear power plant really just uses steam, okay. The nuclear power here just makes water hot enough to turn it into steam, and steam turns a turbine, which generates electricity, okay. It's not actually the nuclear reaction that directly generates electricity. Okay? When they want to slow the reaction down, then they pull more of the rods out or they flood the, the reactor with more water. Okay? Um, either way will slow the reaction. If the water all evaporates, then you're in real trouble. Okay? Then you have a Chernobyl style problem. All right, so that's how a nuclear reactor works. It's very controlled. Okay? The more the, the rod we expose, the more power we can generate, the more heat we make. Okay? Nuclear bomb, on the other hand, we want the reaction to go crazy, okay? We want it to be completely out of control, right? So a nuclear bomb is actually two separate explosions, right? A nuclear bomb works, I'm telling you how to make a nuclear bomb, by the way, okay? Because you will never be able to get the stuff you need to build one, okay? And it's far more complex than what I'm showing you here. This is kind of just the basics of it, okay? You basically have an explosive core that's filled with your fissionable material, a big chunk of plutonium or uranium or whatever it is you're using, okay? And it's surrounded by high explosive, C4, okay? Something like that, all right? And it's a shaped charge. So it's shaped so that when you detonate the high explosive, the particles from the explosion are all focused in on the piece of fissionable material. Okay? So what happens is there's one explosion which then causes a nuclear fission reaction to occur. As more and more of these atoms break, their pieces go off and break other ones that are nearby, and that's what leads to the chain reaction that causes the big mushroom cloud and all the ones in destruction and other stuff. Okay? So there you go. That's a little bomb. Good luck getting stuff in here. They're kind of picky about who's allowed to have that kind of materials. All right. Um, atoms are indivisible, okay? That statement was believed for so long because A, we didn't know about radioactivity, and we didn't know that you could actually break atoms, okay? And of course, we didn't have the technology to do it, okay, for a very, very long time. It wasn't until the kind of late 30s, early 40s, okay, where we were really looking at how to do that. 
Okay, from number 11, from what you know of the structure of the atom, how do you think the atom stays intact? Why do the electrons not fly off or protons separate from the nucleus? They attract each other. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're charged particles. Positive attracts the negative. That keeps the electrons from flying off. Within the nucleus, there's lots of uh, like kind of uh, subatomic forces there, okay? attraction between the neutrons and the protons, okay? their masses and their electronegativity and everything kind of paste them together and keep them intact. Okay. All right, um, and then number 12, we talked about this already, the principle that makes glow-in-the-dark materials work is used by plants to produce food. So that's electrons absorb energy, they make quantum leaps to higher energy levels, and then when they fall back down, that energy is released and it is used to make food. It's used to split water and carbon dioxide and put them back together as glucose, which is how photosynthesis works. Pardon me? Um, certain types of lasers. Yeah. Lasers are mostly photon, which is mostly light. You can have a chemical laser, which would be more of like a hot plasma, okay, kind of thing, but most lasers are actually just concentrated light. Photons work a lot differently than atoms. All right, questions on any of those? All right, then we're going to move on to something else. I'll give you a little break here, maybe about two, three minutes, okay? and then uh, we'll move on to um, naming compounds. Okay, so give you a two or three minute break here. You can check all your snaps and reply real quick.